Hello, ladies Hello. and gentlemen. How lovely to see you all. My name is uh, Sally Magnuson, and a, a warm welcome to this uh, Edinburgh International Book Festival event with David Nichols. Now, just to let you know, if you're not aware already, we are recording this event for uh, Radio Scotland. Uh, it's a Sunday morning programme, and it will be on this Sunday, just after the 10 o'clock news. So uh, if you want to hear it all over again, switch on. Uh, can I just remind anybody, if you've got a, oh, I'm just realising I haven't done it myself, turn off their phones. <laughs> if you hear ringing coming from that bag there, that's me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that nobody calls. Um, and I'm going to start by uh, reading an official um, sort of introduction to David, just to make it fluent with no fluffs for the radio, uh, which means I will fluff and have to start again. But uh, here we go now, and then I'll let you do some almighty applause when I introduce okay. David properly. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Edinburgh International Book Festival event with David Nichols, best-selling novelist, screenplay writer, failed actor. Is that right, David? That's fair enough. Yeah, yep. OK. <laughs> uh, and one of the most acute, sensitive, amusing, and page-turning chroniclers of the awkwardness and tenderness and agonies of adolescence and young love as you could ever hope to read. His latest novel, Sweet Sorrow, does it as ever beautifully. David's probably best known for the novel One Day, which was an enormous hit, if you remember, 10 years ago. Another novel, Us, was nominated for the Booker Prize in 2014. And he's also had gratifying success as a writer of screenplays. Earlier this year, he won a BAFTA for his adaptation of the Patrick Melrose books for television. Please give him a warm Edinburgh welcome. David Nichols. Thank you. Young love, David. Yeah. What is it that keeps pulling you back there in your fiction? Well, the last book I wrote, often the, the, the novel you're writing is defined by the one that you've just left behind. And the last novel I'd written, uh, Us, was about midlife. You know, it was about divorce and breakup and marriage and disillusionment. And I thought, well, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I <laughs> want to kind of find a different angle. And I suppose first love, uh, has a particular quality and um, was something that I hadn't really written about. Um, uh, my very first novel was a coming-of-age novel, a book called Start of a Ten, and I, I thought, given that I'd written a very classic 18-year-old point of view, that I wouldn't be able to go back and do that again. But I wanted to write about um, memory and nostalgia and someone looking back at first love rather than living through it. So. Um, this seemed to be uh, a good area. And I also wanted to write about um, theatre, but from, uh, from a... Uh, theatre's a very, very hard thing to write about in fiction. It's very... Th how do you convey good acting? How do you convey the actual experience of being in a company? It's a very subjective, personal experience. How do you put that on the page? So I wanted to write about it, but from a kind of outsider's point of view, from a, at times quite a satirical point of view, a cynical point of view, but try and convey the experience of being in a play as a young person. Because um, uh, many of my memorable experience, memories of, uh, memorable memories, can we cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no David, we can't. <laughs> many of the most vivid experiences <laughs> from my youth came from that experience of being in a group of people and yeah. putting on a play. I wanted to write about that and try and convey that experience, but, but not in a Poe face kind of yeah, way. Yeah, we'll, and, and we'll, we'll We'll talk about that later as yeah. we as we get into the, the the book, and it's 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 wonderful stuff. But what interests me about your your looking at young love and, and and coming of age, it's it's more than nostalgia, isn't it? Because you're not afraid to allow sadness into your depiction of youth, and there's often bleakness amid the humour. Yeah, I I think uh, one of the key lines in the novel is that the greatest lie age tells about youth is that it's somehow carefree. Um, I certainly don't remember being 16 as a sort of particularly um, uh, joyous time. You know, it's very troubling. And I think especially for, for boys at that age that there's a kind of noise and a uh, kind of gawkiness and a kind of, um, a kind of clamor and a kind of showing off that maybe uh, does conceal something a little sadder, uh, more melancholy, more uh, anxious. And I wanted to write 
about you know, the tenderness and the anxiety and the loneliness of that age, as well as, as writing you know, about the, 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 the outrageous um, practical jokes and the, the, the sort of fooling around. I wanted to, to write something that was frank and honest about that experience. How did you come up with young Charlie Lewis? The kind of boy, as you, as you depict him, nobody ever remembers from the school photo. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was uh, um, often when you create a character, you, you, you when I wrote my um, Start of a Ten, which was my first coming of age novel, Brian Jackson, the central character of that, was quite a big character. You know, had he had all these sort of rather Adrian Molish qualities of pretentiousness, and he was always making gaffes, and he was quite, um, quite noisy and um, foolish. And I didn't want to write another Brian, you know, I wanted to write someone who maybe wasn't um, uh, sure of himself, who hadn't quite worked out his place in the world. And also to cast him as a character in the play, uh, cast him as a character who also doesn't seem to have any particular distinctive qualities. Benvolio, he plays Benvolio in Romeo and Juliet, we'll come to that later. But uh, I feel that often um, 16, 17 is that point where you're trying to you're, you're just about to set, you know, you're trying to work out who you are. You, you still have time to change your signature and the way you laugh and your politics and your taste. You're still in a state of flux before, before you set into a, the adult version of yourself. And Charlie is someone who sees all these people who have a self-image, who have, seem to have a um, terrific confidence, a sense of what they want from life, and he doesn't yet possess that. He's, he's rather... Um, self-conscious and unsure and, and uncertain about the future. And um, often also writing a, a novel in the first person, I'm, I'm always quite careful to write away from myself and my own experience. And Charlie has certain qualities that I absolutely didn't share. Yeah, well, tell, tell us a bit about your, your upbringing, your, your childhood, your hinterland, and, and where, where it, it uh, merges with Charlie's and where it doesn't. Um, I think... Um, Charlie, uh, Charlie has just failed his GCSEs. He's just kind of been shot down in flames in the examination hall, one after another, and is very anxious about the future and unsure what he wants, unsure of what he wants. Um, at 16, I was just getting a sense that I might be quite academic, that I might have a chance to go to university. No one in my family had been to university before, and I didn't really understand what it involved um, or how I'd get in, but I, I was very dogged and determined and quite good at taking exams. I mean, I don't think I was particularly bright. I just knew how to, how to revise. I knew, how, and I worked very hard. And how would you characterize that background, the, the, you know, the first, the, the first boy to have a chance to go to university in a you know, working class background? Yeah, my dad, was a, um, my dad worked in a, a cake factory. He was a mechanic. He was a production uh, engineer. He kept the production lines going as they made Battenbergs and Fond and Fancies and uh, my mum was a dinner lady, and then she worked for the local council, and I didn't, as I say, I was very bookish, and um, in that way, uh, you, when you're 15, 16, you, you present an image to the world, you kind of work on it and work towards it, and, and it becomes quite fixed, and I think I was, you know, a swat. I was a kind of bookish and a would-be intellectual, and very Adrian Molish kind of pretentiousness, uh, and Charlie isn't that at all. You know, Charlie's quite fearful of the future, uncertain of where life is leading him. Uh, his parents have just broken up, so he's living alone with his father. Uh, he and his father can't really talk to each other. So he's much more, I suppose, much more directionless than I was at that age. Um, but what we did share, I think, was a kind of social awkwardness, a kind of gaucheness, a kind of endless, uh, endless gaffes and mm. saying the wrong thing and being very self-aware as, as we speak, yeah. you know, trying to work out, uh, it's almost as if you have what you say and the running commentary that runs above it, and yeah. I think that's quite a common experience at that, at that time and, of time. And one of the most affectionate and, and I, I, I felt heartfelt depictions in the book was, was near the beginning when he's at the school dance. Yeah. Read us a bit okay. from that. Charlie's experience with kissing. So. Was it heartfelt? I mean, do, do I detect a little bit of Nichols' experience in there? The kissing thing? No, I, I Googled that. <laughs> 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 I asked other people. Uh, um, so, um, 
the, 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 the novel starts the last day of the last day of his school and uh, the school disco, and uh, it's the Slowies. I think the song is Careless Whisper, and um, Charlie has been asked to dance, and his friends are watching from the edge of the uh, the dance floor. That's the only other thing you need to know. Lloyd and Fox, his friends, are watching. So the chapter is called Slowies. I held out my arms, and for a moment we found ourselves standing with gripped hands out to the side like pensioners at a tea dance. Emily corrected me, placing my hand on the small of her back, and as we began our first rotation, I closed my eyes and tried to identify an emotion. The artificial starlight suggested I ought to feel romantic. The rasping saxophone, an awareness of her pelvis and the clasp of her bra should have been enough to spark desire, but embarrassment was the emotion I recognized and the only longing I felt was for the end of the song. Love and desire were too tangled up with ridicule, and sure enough, at the edge of the dance floor, Lloyd was waggling his tongue lewdly while Fox turned his back, crossed his arms, and caressed his own shoulder blades. <laughs> I adjusted my right hand so that only the middle finger showed, which seemed pretty witty to me, and we revolved away as the saxophone played on, say something, say anything. Emily spoke first. You smell of boys. Oh, yeah, it's my old games kit. It's all I had. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I like it, she said, and snuffled into my neck, and I felt a wetness there that might have been a kiss or the dab of a damp flannel. Grandmothers aside, I had kissed or been kissed twice before, though it might be more accurate to describe those events as facial collisions. <laughs> the first occasion was in a darkened audiovisual exhibit on a history field trip to Roman remains. There's no reason why anyone should instinctively know how to kiss, like snowboarding or tap dancing, it can't be learned from watching. But Becky Boyne had taken her instruction from Disney fairy tales, pursing her lips into a tight, dry bud that she tapped around my face like a bird getting nuts from a feeder. <laughs> Films had also taught us that a kiss was not a kiss unless it made a noise, and so each point of contact was accompanied by a little lip-smacking sound as artificial as the clip-clop that represents a horse, eyes open or closed. I kept them open in case of discovery or attack and read the wall <laughs> display behind her. The Romans, I noted, had pioneered underfloor heating. <laughs> and on it went, the tap, tap, tap becoming harder and more insistent, like someone trying to unblock a stapler. Kissing Sharon Finley, on the other hand, was an angry, open-mouthed, frenzied shark attack. Both of us jammed down the back of a sofa. Harper had a den, a concrete bunker in the basement of his house, that held a certain notoriety and on Friday nights resembled the Playboy Mansion's fallout shelter. <laughs> Here, Harper presided over exclusive high-rolling DVD parties, doling out own brand lager spiked with soluble aspirin, the olive in our martini, to be drunk through a straw and potent enough to send us behind the sofa, kissing amongst the dust balls and the dead flies. I had never been more aware that the tongue was a muscle, a powerful skinless muscle like the arm of a starfish. And when my tongue tried to fight back against Sharon's, they had wrestled like drunks trying to squeeze past each other in a corridor. <laughs> Whenever I tried to raise my head, it was ground back down into the dusty underlay with the same kind of force and motion required to juice a grapefruit. <laughs> I retain a certain memory that when Sharon Finley belched, my cheeks puffed out. <laughs> and when we finally pulled apart, she wiped her mouth al along the entire length of her arm. The experience left me shaken and sore jawed with two small rips in the corner of my mouth, a third in the root of my tongue, and nauseous too from what must conservatively have been half a pint of someone else's saliva. <laughs> but I was also strangely excited, as if after some harrowing fairground ride, so that I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it again immediately or never again in my life. <laughs> So what was your own first kiss like? <laughs> um, well, it wasn't dissimilar, I suppose. <laughs> but I think, again, you know, it's no, why on earth would you be able to do that at 15, 16? There's no reason why you should, any of these things should be anything other than both terrifying and thrilling at the same time. Mm. Well, it's, it's, it's wonderfully depicted and completely gross. <laughs> Charlie then meets someone he has entirely different feelings about yeah. kissing, and, and w w we will come to that in a minute, but while falling in love, he's also trying to work out a rather complicated relationship with his dad. Yeah. Um, problem relationships with fathers feature 
quite a lot in your fiction. I'm just wondering, yeah. is there something personal there that, that, that you've been trying to work through? Um, I don't know if I'm trying to work through it. I mean, as a, as a kind of form of therapy, I think writing fiction is, doesn't really provide the, the kind of solutions you necessarily uh, need. Uh, but it's certainly something I think about a lot. I mean, I, I did the film adaption of, uh, adaptation of And When Did You Last See Your Father by Greg Morrison. Um, there was a, a, a sort of key father-son relationship in one day. Um, uh, I've just written the Melrose novels, which are about a kind of monstrous father. Um, the last novel was about a, uh, a father sort of trying to save his son on a journey across Europe. That was us. And and this is the last time I'll write about it, I think. I mean, I, I didn't have a particularly comfortable relationship with my father. At the same time, I've never written my father. I've never uh, fictionalized him. I've never uh, written a, anything that I've experienced. But it's something that preoccupies me a lot. Uh, I'm it feels almost like an itch that you keep needing yeah. to scratch. Uh, I think, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a parent myself, and I, I always found it... My father, I, 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 the last novel I wrote was a novel called Us, and it began as a story about marriage and relationships. And, uh, and then uh, I stopped writing it halfway through because my father became quite ill. And then he died, and I took a little bit of time off and then went back to write the second half of the novel, and something happened to the novel. It became absolutely about a, 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 a father and son relationship. And as an experience, um, the experience of writing, it was very emotional. Again, nothing in that book uh, is drawn from life. The father in that book is nothing like my dad, They're completely the opposite in many ways. But I do feel a, a, a great regret that we didn't have a more comfortable relationship. Um, my father uh, was made redundant uh, at about my age, in his sort of early 50s, just at the point that I was going off to university and kind of relishing the experience and kind of completely burying myself in this world of plays and books and poetry and film and I was so preoccupied with that that I don't think I paid much attention to to what he was going through in fact I think I was probably a bit dismissive of it certainly insensitive about it in a in a way that is not unusual for um, teenagers uh, because there's so much happening to you inevitably you're going to be at the center of your own life um, but I, I do feel a bit regretful about that. Mm. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's all made up, and at the same time, it's all true. You know, it's, uh, that's, what, that's how fiction tends to work. But it certainly doesn't work as a form of, of therapy. I mean, God knows if it did, I'd be much calmer about <laughs> it all. But um, I think whatever I write next, I, I, will, uh, I don't know what the next book will be, but I'm pretty sure that that particular relationship won't feature. I'm just going to read a little ident for the radio now. You're listening to Sunday Morning with me, Sally Magnuson, here at the Edinburgh International Book Festival with David Nichols. David, the way out for Charlie this summer in 1997 is through joining an earnest production of Romeo and Juliet in the grounds of the nearby mansion so that he can get to meet the girl. Yeah. And, you know, if possible, take her out for a coffee. That's yeah. his, that's that's his, his first yeah. aspiration. Um, you write about his agonies in joining that cast with enormous humor and, and affection again. And, and uh, you know, since you were possibly a failed actor in your past, yeah. there is fellow feeling in there. Um, d just g tell us about your, your own attempts to be an actor and what you're drawing on for these marvelous scenes in the book. Well, I was, I mean, I was a failed actor um, in professional terms, but I was always quite a good, what they call, it's, uh, it's a terrible euphemism, but I was a good company member in that I was very uh, enthusiastic. I mean, I really loved doing plays. I, lo I, I didn't actually, strangely, like going to the theatre particularly. I didn't really go to the theatre until I was 18, 19. I certainly didn't see Shakespeare on stage until I was 20. I, 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 I watched a huge amount of TV and film, and I loved actors in, uh, on the screen. But I also really loved um, the sense of a company. Uh, I loved the kind of feuds and the drama and the, the crushes and the intrigue. And that's why I kept going, really. I think I had a, a, a sense of wanting to be involved somehow with storytelling, but not really knowing how I would do that professionally, because uh, it seemed inconceivable to me that I would be a novelist. I mean, how did, how did that come about? And I had no idea about screenwriting. 
So I kind of felt that being in plays was the only way I could maintain a contact uh, with that world. Because um, even though the, the, the profession itself is hugely insecure, you can be in productions, whether it's on an amateur level, or student or fringe, whatever, you can do stuff. So, I, so for most of my 20s, I was an actor, but I only ever played tiny parts. I was at the National Theatre for a long time, playing soldiers and servants and little walk-on parts and understudying roles, learning these great, huge, wonderful roles, Constantine and the Seagull and uh, all these fantastic parts and just never performing them or performing them to an empty theatre. You know, I've played Constantine in the Seagull on the stage of the National Theatre to an empty auditorium, <laughs> um, which is a very particular experience. And I loved it. I was very, very happy to be doing it. Um, but I knew that I couldn't do it forever. And I also knew that when I saw brilliant actors, I mean, for instance, in, in that production of The Seagull, I was going on every night playing a Russian peasant watching Judy Dench uh, uh, perform. And, and I could tell very early on in my profession that I couldn't do that, that even if I couldn't quite identify or name the quality, it was something that I didn't really possess. So my acting career was really uh, a, a, a sort of eight-year period of trying to work out what else I could do. Um, one of my best jobs, an early job, was uh, I was cast in the first production of Arcadia, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. Um, and I was sat in the rehearsal room week after week after week, seeing this play come to life, seeing the play change, seeing Tom Stoppard do little rewrites on the spot, seeing these brilliant actors, Harriet Walter, Bill Nye, whatever, um, inhabit these roles. And I think I got a sense that I couldn't do that, but that I, I was fascinated by the, the process of writing. I was fascinated at how this play transformed and also at what the actors contributed to the production. And so um, I began reading scripts for various theatres, um, and then I began writing script reports, and then I became a full-time script editor. Uh, I had to choose between a two-year job at the RSC in a touring production of Twelfth Night playing Valentine, who has, I think, two lines, or being a script reader for BBC Radio. And I took that path and found that that, that was a much better fit. But, you know, I had eight years of, of largely being unemployed, and when I was employed, often giving quite bad <laughs> performances, <laughs> uh, or not performing at all, still being in the production, but not really doing anything you could call acting. And it was a strange kind of apprenticeship for writing. I didn't have the confidence to show anyone my writing when I was 22 or 23 or 29, but as I, or I, I came at it from another direction and, and I was sort of eased into it. Well, you say uh, you enjoyed the experience. Charlie Lewis absolutely doesn't yeah. enjoy it, and you, you send up beautifully the sort of slight pretentiousness of the, you know, the, the, the whole operation uh, yeah. going on at the mansion. Um, but give us a, give us a flavor, Would okay. readers, um, the scene where you know he's he's met this delectable Fran Fisher, who's uh, same age as, as he is, but m sort of massively more uh, confident and experienced, and uh, she has sort of enticed him into this this play. Yes, and they've had a day of rehearsals. I think I'm right in saying at this point, and they're walking home. That's right. They've had they've been doing the the trust exercises and the name games and improvisations and. For Charlie, it's been absolute torture. Um, but it's the price he has to pay. And this is their first walk home. We walked the length of the driveway in silence, and it was a long driveway. Then out into the canopied lane that led down to the main road, and still the only voice was, in th was the one in my head, the voice that ordered me, concentrate. This will matter. Concentrate. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk today, she said. Yeah, it was quite full on. We walked further. I thought maybe you were avoiding me, I said. Not at all, I, I tried, but every time I looked up, you were pretending to be a cat, so. <laughs> and here she laughed, too much, I thought, and stowed her hair behind her ear. Yes, sorry about that. If anything, I thought you were avoiding me. God, no. It had never occurred to me that being aloof might be interpreted as aloofness. <laughs> it's just I'm not used to that kind of stuff. I don't think anyone ever gets used to it. We walked on. The heat of the day still lingered under the canopy, the still air blurred here and there with clouds of midges like thumbprints on a photo. Some way off we could hear the low hum of the motorway, and I was aware too of the chatter of the theatre company members behind us, keeping their distance, stalking. 
So be honest, she said. Did you hate every second? Is that how it looked? Sometimes. When you were being a statue, I thought you were suddenly going to, like, lash out. I'm no good at that stuff. You were. I thought your human steam engine was amazing, and I don't <laughs> say that kind of thing lightly. <laughs> and here she started laughing again, putting her hand to her mouth. Well, like I said, it's not my thing. So why did you come? I kept my eyes fixed ahead. Try something new? Keeps you busy? Off the streets? Out of trouble? Are you in trouble? Not really, just bored at home. And were you bored today? Not bored? Well, there you are then. Embarrassed. Yeah, well, everyone gets that to begin with. It's like when you join the Foreign Legion or the SAS and you have to carry a fridge on your back and drink low wee or whatever. Here you have to play the hat game. It's so we're all bonded and uninhibited. Do you feel bonded? Not massively bonded. Uninhibited? Inhibited. Well, maybe once we start working on the play. What's your part? I don't know, um, Sam something? Samson. Well, there you go. Lots of insults, lots of bawdy jokes. He's a real saucy little lad. Oh, God, I said. Just don't do that thing when you thrust your hips. Leave that to Juliet. Which is you? <laughs> it is, she pulled a face. It is. The eponymous role, I said. She laughed. Though the eponymous role is not always the best role. Ideally, I suppose you'd rather be playing Samson, I said. That's my dream. We smiled at each other and walked on through the soft green marine light, dappled and shimmering like the water in a rock pool. Observations like this would come to me occasionally, things that might pass as poetry, and I thought about pointing it out, the rock pool thing, unsure if this would make me seem poetical or a bit of a knob. <laughs> there was some overlap between the two, <laughs> so I decided to keep my observation to myself. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. You are just so good at these agonies, but I couldn't help noticing that the teenage girls, yeah. especially the preternaturally composed Fran, seem to have a better idea of what they're doing and who they are. You know, they, they're rather self-confident and sharp and witty, which is presumably how teenage girls appear to teenage boys. I just wondered if yeah. you really think they're like that? Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I've never really written a kind of pen oh. portrait. I've never really, that Fran isn't anyone real, uh, just as Emma in one day wasn't anyone real. But there's certainly aspects of my female friends in them, and sometimes the odd joke that I've heard in real life might sneak in. Or the, the I just never dryness. remember being as sharp and, <laughs> and composed but I think, and confident you know, and at 15. I'm aware <laughs> also of drawing on a, a tradition. You know, I love uh, a tradition of a certain kind of romantic comedy that's very sharp and spiky and, and where, you know, in, it's certainly in classic Hollywood screwball comedy where, yes, the, 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 the female characters tend to have the best lines and tend to be a little bit sharper witted, a little bit smarter, a little bit further ahead of the game. But I think, you know, that's part of a genre, that's part of a convention. It doesn't necessarily reflect real life, though thinking about my female friends, maybe it, it is true, yeah. What's done so beautifully in the book is, is not just Charlie's falling in love with Fran, but falling in love through Shakespeare yeah. with words. At one, at one point, he says it was contagious poetry. Yeah. And I just wonder if that's how you found it, if you, um, you also had a love affair with words. I think so. I mean, certainly when I was, uh, up until I was sort of 15, 16, I th I was science was my thing, and I was going to be a doctor I, or, or, or uh, and, uh, something um, to do with uh, the natural world, you know, a zoologist or something. That's what I really loved. And about that time, I, that was my kind of peak reading time as well, and the time where also I really fell in love with, with film and, and television. Uh, and there was a bit of a tussle, I think, at about that time of my life. Uh, and uh, in the end, you know, the books and the films and the plays won, and, and I took that direction. And I really did love it. I mean, I was an obsessive library user. Um, and uh, read my way through the shelves very methodically, at the same time watching film after film after film on television and all the sitcoms, all the soap operas, all of it was sort of jumbled up. And, and, and so I didn't really make a distinction, I suppose, between 
you know, the poetry between the high art and, and the stuff that was just on television every day. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly at that age, I had a huge passion for it. And Charlie doesn't, you know, he's very skeptical. He's not really a reader. He doesn't really believe that, that, um, that this stuff can change your life. I suppose he's aware of something else, which is the kind of a slight um, uncomfortable relationship between you know, art and literature and education and class that often uh, uh, the things which he feels drawn to, he's also excluded from because he thinks that they're not, they're not for him. And certainly the idea at the beginning of the novel, the idea of being in a Shakespeare play seems to him you know, both ridiculous and preposterous and hellish. You know, he really doesn't want anything to do with it. And that does change over the course of the play, uh, over the course of the novel. But I don't want to be too sentimental about that. You know, in many ways, it's also um, creates a bit of a divide for him, a divide between him and his friends who think that he's taking a strange turn and, 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 and becoming a bit snobbish and snooty. Your fiction sells very well, and no wonder. It's, uh, it's incredibly readable. But there's always a bit of a whiff of literary snobbery about books that sell well. I wonder yeah. to what extent you're conscious of that and whether getting on the, the Booker long list with us um, was all the sweeter because of that? Um, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a, an amazing thing to happen and I was hugely proud of it. I was pretty sure I wouldn't make the short list and certain that I wouldn't win, but I was delighted to be on the long list. And um, I don't know, I, I, I was also aware because people pointed them out to me of people saying, what the hell is that doing on the long list? You know, I'm, I'm aware of, of, um, of that discussion happening. Is it literary snobbery? Uh, I don't know. I don't feel particularly, I'm wary of, of feeling too hard done by. I mean, uh, I'm very, very lucky in that respect. And I think also there are a lot of writers who write brilliant commercial fiction who don't get the attention uh, perhaps that they deserve. Uh, a lot of women writers who should who should be better known and should be uh, better regarded by a kind of a literary world. So I, I feel I don't feel particularly hard done by. Um, uh, I'm very happy to to exist in this sort of in this strange area between where where you do get reviewed and you you do ask you know what your books of the year are at Christmas and all of that stuff <laughs> and also that the books do okay. So I I feel um, I think it would be very churlish of me. Uh, to, to, to feel too hard done by. I, I, I'm, um, I don't know, I don't feel particularly head up about it. I, I, I feel quite happy where I am. You're often compared to the, the screenwriter Richard Curtis and his yeah. screen sort of rom-coms. Um, yeah. do, you, do you take that as a, a compliment? Of course, yeah. I mean, I think um, Four Weddings and a Funeral is a classic romantic comedy and he does it brilliantly. And um, I think when I started out screenwriting, uh, I was often asked to, to write that kind of film and sometimes tried and couldn't really do it. I mean, I think it requires a kind of uh, a, a particular set of skills that I didn't really have, um, certainly not at that time. Um, so yes, I do. I mean, I, 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 I've never really, I feel a bit at sea with cinema because I really love cinema. And I've made, uh, written six films now, six produced screenplays. And and never quite cracked it, you know. If I, I'm not sure what I'll do next, but I'd love to have um, to write an original screenplay, and have what, that kind what of. What is it uh, that's inhibiting you from cracking it? Do you think? I don't know. I think perhaps um, feeling tugged, perhaps in two different directions. I'd love something to be a commercial success. At the same time, I think I'm sort of drawn towards a sort of uh, a sort of sadness, a kind of. Um, an awkwardness, a kind of uh, complexity, isn't it? It's, it's not. Yeah, it's never I simple. I, I I find it um hard to shake off a kind of melancholic, <laughs> awkward, difficult, ambiguous quality. I I've never really managed a happy ending, um, and I think quite often the experience of going to the cinema means that that's exactly what you want. Mm. Uh, uh, when they turn start of a ten into a film, if genre is much more um uh, is much more taken into consideration with film. And uh, the ending of Start of a Ten is quite ambiguous. You're not quite sure who he's in love with or how he feels or what, he's gonna, what the future's going to bring for Brian. And when we made the film, I, I, I knew in advance that there'd be a demand for a more, I suppose, a more traditional romantic comedy ending. And uh, I tried to write it, and I hated writing it. And uh, in the end, I was sort of flown out to America and locked in the edit suite to write a voiceover 
that would give you the kind of uplift that you expect in a comedy film, or particularly kind of romantic comedy film, the kind of running to the airport feeling. And I couldn't do it, you know, I couldn't. I, I managed to produce something, but I hated it. And at the same time, I don't necessarily think the producers were wrong to want it. Um, so I feel in my original screenwriting, I kind of fall between those two stools. I'm probably too mainstream to write an art movie and um, too arty to write a mainstream commercial success. And I, I, uh, I haven't worked a way out of that. And I also think that often in film, um, the pairing that you have with a director is absolutely key because um, unless you see eye to eye, it can be quite a frustrating experience. And I've never quite found that perfect match. It's a bit like I've been on six quite enjoyable but not entirely successful dates with different directors mm. and never quite found uh, the, the right match. So well, you've had a very successful date with screen adaptations such yeah. as um, Patrick Melrose yeah. books, which, um, which have some very dark yeah. corners. Yes. How exhilarating did you, did you find it to explore somebody else's rather darker fictional universe? Well, it was wonderful. I mean, it was a very long process, so it wasn't exhilarating for five years. <laughs> it was quite frustrating for quite a lot of it. But I really loved those books. And in a way, Melrose was the perfect uh, source material because they the books were extremely well regarded, but not perhaps as well known as they ought to be. So there was the opportunity to introduce new readers to the world. And at the same time, I, I was very keen to do a very uh, a largely faithful adaptation for the people who did know and love the books. And it was, uh, it was um, thrilling to see them come to life. I think of all the things I've written for the screen, that's the one I'm, I'm proudest of, because I think we did, as a team, manage to distill uh, the quality of the novels and, and put that on screen. But it was very, very dark material. And um, to, 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 um, to write the scripts, I listened to the audiobooks. Um, constantly for about three or four years. Whenever I left the house, I just press play and walk around listening to these audiobooks in my head uh, so that I could not recite it, but I pretty much knew where everything came. And it's a very dark world. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a world that's entirely free of traditional romantic love. And that was great for me as a writer to, 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 um, to be able to do something new. Quite often I find that the writers I've adapted whether it's Dickens or Hardy or Edwardson or Auburn, they've kind of given a, a boost and a leg up to my own writing. Uh, they Because inevitably you have to invent new stuff. You have to write in the style of, you have to produce scenes that sound like Edwardson or Auburn, even though they're not Edwardson or Auburn. And you find, it's very reassuring to find out that you can do it. You can do it without seeing the join. And so I think my own books have become uh, kind of more varied and confident because of the contact I've had with these other great, great uh, novelists. Uh, so I'm extremely grateful for that as well. But I could never sit down and write that story without the, the boost, the leg up, the, the starting point that the, the novels provide. What do you find hardest about writing novels yourself? What I mean, is it a plot or characterization, finding the idea in the first place, structuring? Yeah, I um, think the initial idea is terrifically difficult. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, uh, there's been, it's been the last two novels, it's, it's almost six years since us and ten years now since one day. And I'd love to write more, but I, I feel that I have, to, I have to feel very confident and passionate about the, the story and characters before I can, I can begin. When I've tried to improvise a novel, I've always ended up throwing it away. And, uh, and, and so it doesn't happen as often as I'd like. And at the moment, it's the idea of writing another book seems impossible. I mean, I feel like, you know, the well really is dry now. <laughs> That's it. I've written everything that I have to say. Do you, do you have it mapped out in your, in your yeah. head and imagination before you write the first yeah. word? I mean, very briefly, the process for this book was that I had a kind of scrapbook, a kind of uh, a, a document just called novel that I could put anything in and no one would ever see it. And for about a year, I filled that up with little extracts and passages and descriptive passages and exchanges of dialogue and character sketches and story ideas, and roughly based around the ideas of coming of age, putting on a play, uh, first love. And this document grew to about 75,000 words. Then I, I had a pause where I went off and worked on Patrick Melrose quite intently for a while. And then I went back and printed out the document and just highlighted what I thought was worthwhile and good. 
and usable. And that was about 15,000 words. And then I opened a new document, which was called Summer. And I began writing you know, chapter one and working through the book. But I, did, I couldn't have done that second stage until I had a pretty comprehensive set of notes. Um, and I'd spend about a year writing the first draft, another four months writing the second draft, uh, six weeks doing a third draft, three weeks doing a copy edit, w two weeks doing a proofread, and that was the process. And that process, I'm making it sound like that's a kind of recipe. It really isn't. Every book has been different. But that was how the last book works. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have written chapter one until I had a pretty good idea of what the final chapter was going to be. And are, are you one of these um, writers who says, you know, I, I, my character has just took me over? I, you know, I was nope. taken completely <laughs> by surprise, and, and, and I went over there when I had meant to go there. No, no, I, no, no, not at all. No, I feel like I, I, I know. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I my um, career as an actor was a bit of a disaster, but I did learn certain techniques uh, uh, that actors apply when they apply to playing a role that prove very useful in writing a novel. You know, what does this character want? What is this character's biographical background? What's this character's favorite song? And, and I wouldn't start writing a novel until I was pretty sure that I could answer all of those questions and that the, the, uh, that the character was setting out on a journey to, 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 to a certain point, a predetermined point. And so, you know, there are things that, that take me by surprise emotionally, uh, that I, I find certain things um, touching or uh, exchanges of dialogue that I hadn't expected. It's not all preconceived, pre-planned. Uh, but I largely know what the arc is going to be mm -hmm. because I've come from um, screenwriting and acting where, well, certainly with screenwriting, architecture is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, I'm full of admiration for writers who can, who can improvise and, 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 and find their way as they go along. But I, I, every time I've tried that, I, I've always ended up putting a horrible number of words in the, in, in the, the little virtual bin in the right-hand corner of the... But I think it is one of the key to your novel's, um, you know, S apostrophe readability is is because you are um, you are structuring it so carefully. You're withholding information here. You're yeah. you're dropping it in there. In you know, there's a sense of there's a sense of discipline in the writing that the reader trusts. The reader trusts that if you take us here or there, it's because you're going to take us there somewhere yeah. else later, and we can relax into it, I think. Uh, I mean, it's lovely to hear that. I don't necessarily think fiction always has to be like that. You know, I think one of the pleasures of fiction is it can be, it can go off on tangents and it can speculate on certain things, and not everything has to serve the plot. I think sometimes I apply a kind of edit sweet mentality to writing a book you know when you when you put something on screen whether it's tv or film every minute costs a huge amount of money and so people are constantly going to ask you do we need this what's this for has this is this telling us something that we already know is this repetitious is this um uh is this subplot really working and and so there's a, a quite a lot of striking out and um I ask myself the same questions, I think, when I'm writing fiction. You know, have we had this chapter before? Do we, is it better not to know this just yet? And, and um, that comes to me naturally because that's how I learned, because I learned screenwriting before I learned writing fiction. Mm -hmm. Now, I really don't think that's, uh, uh, that's, some, that's a demand we should make of novelists. I think I read many novelists where I feel that these chapters are unnecessary, but they're also wonderful in themselves because they're, they're prose. Uh, there are words on the page. They're not costing anything. You're not having to hire actors or costumes or lighting equipment. And and there's no reason why books need to function as screenplays in another form. But I am, as a novelist, very influenced by film and TV. I love writing dialogue. I tend to write three-act structures. I think quite a lot about withholding information, um, uh, how time is used. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of that comes naturally, I think. But um, it's not something that I necessarily look for in the writers I enjoy. And finally, you you don't know what's coming next, is that right? And you're um, feeling a bit arid, perhaps? Uh, I am a little bit. I feel <laughs> we're, we're currently, f um, uh, while I'm publicizing Sweet Sorrow, which I'm enjoying massively, uh, we're filming the, the BBC TV adaptation of my last book, Us, uh, with Tom Hollander playing Douglas, for those of you who know the, the novel. He's being really 
wonderful. And so uh, today they're in Amsterdam filming all these scenes, and I really ought to be there, and so it's quite stressful. Uh, oh, you're much better <laughs> here. <laughs> it's quite stressful <laughs> seeing the rushes, because the rushes, it's too late. You know, when you see the <laughs> rushes, it's all gone, it's all been filmed, that's it. Uh, so it's, um, it's been quite a stressful time, and I have this image of the, uh, the winter of just stopping for a while and reading. Uh, instead, but um, uh, but I've also loved talking about this book because it's of all the five, you know, this is the one I love the most, and and the one that I'm that I'm most proud or proudest. I want to get it right if it's going out on radio. But you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna stop. You're you're yeah. waiting for for the next one to come to you. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I really would love to be more prolific. I I, I would love to write more prose because I uh, screenwriting is also terrific fun, but very, very, very stressful for a lot of the time. Um, uh, so I'd love to write another book before too long. Okay. Well, we're going to go to the audience now and uh, see what uh, they've got to ask you. We have a couple of roving mics here. Do put uh, a hand up and uh, we will bring a mic to you right away. Here's a question here. Thank you. Hi. You said about um, uh, being a, an actor looking at the screenwrite, a screenwriter and, and you know, getting interested in that. What's it like in reverse, you know, when you're writing and then you're looking at actors interpreting your characters? Um, it's really wonderful, uh, really exciting. I mean, that's why I want to continue, you know, f for all my complaints. That's why I, I really hope I can continue writing for the screen. Um, the tricky thing is you never really know what they're going to bring. So quite often you'll write a scene or a speech that when you see the performance, you realize is superfluous because the actor can do so much. Um, you don't know that while you're sat at your keyboard. Uh, when, you're, when you're writing a screenplay, you're writing this instruction manual and you're trying to um, give it a little bit of color so it's not just a kind of uh, a, a, a very pragmatic text. You want to give it a little bit of novelistic color, but you can't do too much because um, you can't tell the actors what to do. You have to strike a particular balance. And often I've been, I've written scenes that when I've seen the actor perform it, I've thought uh, either that we didn't need that or that it could have been given another twist or a little inflection. Um, but I'm more often than not really grateful to actors for what they, for what they bring um, and for the holes that they fill in. Uh, and um, I, I have a very, I, the one thing I can't, quite understand though is I get very nervous around them as a screenwriter. I think possibly I'm scared that they're going to ask for rewrites, but <laughs> I don't, so I'm not the kind of screenwriter who spends a lot of time with the actors. I tend to run away and uh, just watch the, 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 the playback. Um, but I'm, I mean, on Melrose, for instance, I was amazed and delighted and uh, uh, constantly surprised by what the actors were, were providing. Um, so it's a, it's, um, even though it's a relationship that makes me a little anxious, it's something that I really want to maintain. Thank you. One down at the front here. Th thank you very much. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, reading about the relationship in one day and, and reading the excerpt um, today. I, I'm just curious, I guess, to find out more about how you find it, you know, I, I think this is the sort of stuff that most I feel embarrassed about first kisses and first relationships. Yeah. And I always thought, well, other girls had got this sussed and they were having a fantastic <laughs> time. And it's come as a great r relief and, and uh, lots of reassurance to know that actually other people weren't having such a great time. But <laughs> it feels like you're one of the first people to write about this stuff. And I just I, I, I just love to, to know a bit more about, you know, the, the thinking about it and how you, you, you've basically broken t taboos, I, I guess, to do it. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, uh, I mean, it's not. Uh, it it is all made up. I mean, I I spent the summer of my sixteenth year working in a, a in a coffee percolator factory. We didn't do any anything remotely like this. <laughs> um, uh, so it's 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 not from um, lived experience. But I suppose, uh, oh, I'm not quite sure how to. Um, I mean, I, I I'm delighted if it if it if it strikes a chord. I, I'm very aware that 
I, I mean, I, I'm very aware of having drawn on other writers, though. You know, I, I, I mean, Sue Townsend's Adrian Mole has been was a huge influence to me. And when I was that age and I read that book, I did. I had a similar feeling. I thought, oh my God, I recognise this. I know what this feels like. Uh, there are several books like that that I kind of um, reread or thought a lot about when I was writing this book. Um, I want to be kind of honest about it, about how difficult it is and how awkward and and painful and and also how. Um, those regrets can kind of last a lifetime. There are, I, I can sit here quite easily and sum up things that I did or said when I was 15 or 16 and make my shoulders rise towards <laughs> my ears, you know, uh, even now. Um, oh, go on, tell us them. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few of them have found their way into fiction <laughs> in a heavy fictionized form. But um, I think it's important to be honest about that stuff. and. And I think in this book, more than the others, perhaps I've been a little bit more honest about it. Uh, especially from, about from, the, from the boy's point of view, though, I mean, am I picking yeah. up from you, you your sense also that per perhaps, you know, the, 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 yeah. the, 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 the girls had a polish that I never had <laughs> at that stage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, I, I wonder if anyone looks back at 16 and thinks, yep, I did that. Uh, exactly <laughs> as I should have done it. I mean, it's a, uh, it's um, it's uh, I ho I suspect a kind of a universal experience. And I, there's certainly the coming of age books that I kind of drew on that I I've, I've read in the past and enjoyed, and that, that have sort of inspired this book, that have been by my side while I've been writing this book, are all about that, are all about the difficulties and the, the anxieties and the regrets. Um, Yes, uh, let's see, we've got one here, a gentleman there, and uh, then there's somebody down here, if you want. Uh, hi, well, hi. first, congratulations, it's a great book, I really enjoy it. Um, I would like to know more about your relationship with success. You sold an awful lot of books, um, yeah. and I wonder, what's your relationship with you after one day? It's like you write with freedom, because you have certain financial stability, or you write with fear, because you need to sell a lot of books now <laughs> again. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I was, I was, um, I was extremely grateful for the success of One Day, and 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 absolutely, I recognise that as a writer, financial stability is is invaluable. Uh, I got incredibly self-conscious. I mean, I found it extremely hard to write anything, and I I rented this grim little kind of Victorian office with which had nothing but a a table and chair, and I thought the way to, to write the next book was to live this very kind of ascetic life, ascetic, ascetic lifestyle and just kind of lock myself away. But the, the, the battle I suppose I had was whether I should try and write something that was, would have similar appeal or whether I should show my great versatility in the way that actors are sometimes <laughs> tempted to do and do something completely wildly different and surprise everyone and, and show everyone what a fantastic literary writer I was. And I kind of dallied between these two things for a long time. And I also certainly had this experience of knowing that, that whatever I wrote, it wouldn't be as successful as what I'd just written. I mean, inev almost inevitably, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have that same uh, appeal around the world. And it's ridiculous to sit there and think, oh, this isn't going to work in Italy. I mean, you can't <laughs> think like that as a writer. <laughs> you just have to write what, you, what you're passionate about, what you're preoccupied with, and what you feel is important to put on the page. So I, I did worry a lot, and I, I, I spent a, the most part of a year grinding out this novel, which I did think was going to uh, show people how versatile I was and that I wasn't just you know, the one-day guy. And... Um, after a year, I'd only written about 40,000 words. And I gave them to my agent on December the 20th, and we met up on January the 4th, and we threw it all away. Uh, it took about half an hour to realize that it wasn't the right book, and that it was perverse to, to, to write what I'd written, a very mean uh, book that didn't have any kind of uh, romantic relationships. It was just a very angry book about, you guessed it, fathers and sons. and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I'm very, very glad that we threw it away. It was, it was horrible to do at the yeah, time. Yeah, how, how difficult was that? Well, uh, looking back, it's a great relief because I could have finished it because I knew what was going to happen. You know, I knew where it was going to go. But it would have been a very sour and disappointing follow-up. And I, I know that, you know, I, uh, us didn't sell nearly as many copies as one day. Um, but um, I knew it was, I felt that it was the right book 
to write. You know, I felt that it, it, was, a, it was different enough uh, to, for me to feel that I wasn't repeating myself, but not so wildly different that it was going to uh, disappoint everyone who read it. And so it was, the, it was the right balance. But I think that kind of self-consciousness is, is, uh, is a real problem. But it's the only downside. I mean, in every other respect, I'm, I'm hugely grateful for the way in which one day took off. And you know, that's the worst thing that ever happens to you as a novelist. <laughs> it's fine. Um, <laughs> I feel now, I, I feel a little calmer about it now, you know, because I've, it's, I've written us and I've written this book now and I, I'm very proud of them both and I feel like um, I feel like there might be a sixth book in there somewhere. At the same time, you know, on the way here, someone said to me, um, uh, I read your book and really enjoyed it. And I knew they weren't talking about the start of a 10. You know, I knew they were talking about one day and I knew that would always be my book. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I think we've got time for a last, yeah. a last question here. Thank you. Um, well, people say that in order for a book to garner the reader's, reader's attention from the very first, you should start you know, right in the action and not have anything superfluous yeah. at the beginning. And when I'm writing, I find that quite difficult because I want to sort of set up the world and explain what's going on before I get into the story. So I was wondering whether you have any advice for a writer on how to decide how and, and when a book should start and what you should leave for just yourself and that the readers don't really need to know? Um, One and a half minute masterclass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing to say is no one is going to you know, sneak in and publish it without your permission. So you should just put everything on the page because you have absolute control over it. And it's better to have it on the page rather than, than worry about it. You can always edit. And um, I would just get it all down, set up the world, um, find one or two trusted readers and, 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 and pass it on to them and ask them exactly that question. But you, uh, you, it, you may well find that the first uh, 10 or 15,000 words are superfluous or that you can take the best of it and, and put it later. That's absolutely what happened to this book. I mean, I won't get into it too much because many people won't have read it, but this book was much more chronological and it told the whole story of the parents' marriage. And it wasn't until page 80 that he met Fran well, if you're going to write a, a love story, if you're going to write about first love, you can't wait until you're nearly a third of the way into the book for that meeting to take place. Now, if I'd, if I'd suddenly worried about that before I started typing, I'd have never written anything. But because I'd written all of that stuff, because I was able to cut it and, and put it into a separate file and, and know that it was still there, then it was absolutely fine. So my advice would be just put it on the page and edit. You know, it's... it's, it's um, Technology makes it so much easier. It's much better to have this big bag of stuff than worry about every single word coming out being, being exactly the right word. So um, you will definitely have plenty of chances to reorganize and restructure, cut things, move things later, all of that stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that brings this event to a close. Sweet Sorrow is published by Hodder and Stoughton. David, it's been a joy. Thank you very much. I Please join me in showing our warm appreciation to Thank you for David coming. Nichols. Thank you very much. Thank you. And David will be hastening straight to the signing tent now. Please uh, queue up in your hundreds to get this book. And um, thank you for coming. That's I, I really enjoyed it. It's the biggest audience I've ever spoken to, so I'm very <laughs> grateful. Thank you very much.